joined the department in 1994. Um, when I came, I was actually it's a, a position which is really no longer in existence, an assistant director of research. And my appointments spanned social political sciences, the Department of Education and the Institute of Criminology. And the job um, was to try to sort out the mess that Cambridge had got into in terms of its lack of, of training for PhD students in, in research methods. Um, so, so that was my brief to, to try and get a, a proper training program up and running. I'm glad to say that since then um, there is a very good training program now uh, for social science PhD students, but it's taken quite a long time to develop. So I started out as an ADR when I became a university lecturer once the probation period was over, that position was just in social political sciences, so I stopped being affiliated with education criminology. Although I think I've always been interested very much in the work that those two departments are doing. And then um, I became a reader and got a personal chair in empirical sociology and uh, did two stints as head of department that was you know in the first of the decades of the new millennium well i mean, I mean the, the that particular uh, achievement in, in terms of um, graduate education has involved a lot of departments and it's now a very big program the um, Centre for Social Science Research Methods. Um, but let me focus in on, on the department and its um, achievements. And I think um, you could talk about that in, in two areas. I mean, they're interrelated, obviously, but both research and teaching. And um, the department's been successful, um, in, in my view, in, 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 in both areas. Um, I think in terms of research, it's easiest for me to draw on, on, on experience that I've had directly in terms of, of directing large research programmes. And the biggest programme I directed was um, a project that ran from 2004 right through to 2010, looking at, at gender inequalities. It was, it was called GNET. Um, and it spanned several universities, but the main thing um, was that it was for five years initially. So it was an opportunity to really bring people from different disciplines together and get them talking about the same, researching into the same questions, but using slightly different angles, different methodologies. And I think that's one of the huge strengths of the department. It's always been sociology, seeing itself as a very broad church, seeing itself as, as part of other disciplines. And so I was able to draw on people from social geography, from economics, from social policy, um, from law, um, business studies, etc. I mean, it, it, it was really a, a, a I mean, gender inequalities, like so many of the social science challenges, is inherently interdisciplinary. I mean, the disciplinary boundaries just make no sense. So sociology is very good, uh, I, I think, at, at positioning itself for interdisciplinary work. Second strength um, is that sociology at Cambridge has always been sort of theoretically led empirical research. And I think that balance has, has probably actually improved over the years. Um, when I first joined Cambridge, it, it probably was more known for, um, you know, somewhat abstract um, theoretical work in the sense of not being necessarily well rooted in the empirical data. And I think that balance now is, is a, a, a very well appreciated one and it also actually spills across into our teaching both at MPhil and graduate at PhD level. 
A third characteristic of, of the research at Cambridge in sociology is that it, it has always had an orientation that's, that's pushed it towards um, potential social policy applications. And, and that certainly for me um, was a great strength and I, th I think a strength in terms of research at Cambridge in sociology anyway. In terms of teaching, um, Cambridge is a great, great place to uh, be in as a teacher. And it's also one of the reasons that we tend to top the league tables, particularly you know, in the undergraduate legal league tables. As a methodologist, I'm, I'm sort of interested in measurement and you only have to look at the main criteria for those league tables to see that one of the driving factors is the quality of the students that we take in. We're very privileged in terms of being able to really select extremely strong students for Cambridge and I think it's really fair that that is one of the measurements um, of, of teaching standard because students learn as much, possibly even more, from their peers and the teaching and learning process really does go on right the way through. As a teacher, um, I continue to learn a great deal, particularly from my uh, PhD students. I've still got four PhD students going through. Three are from China, one's from Singapore, and I've never actually been to um, either of those countries. So although I can um, teach and guide in terms of the background needed for their studies, I also gain an enormous amount of insight um, into, you know, sort of contexts and ideas that I would not otherwise come across. So it's really an ongoing process. It's a superb learning environment. The one of the big challenges is is where sociology is positioned in terms of the institution of the university. And this matters because um, departments and faculties are a sort of divide up of, of resources that are made available to the different disciplines. You know, 50 years ago in 1968, the Social Political Sciences Committee um, was set up and, and that really put us on to a pathway that allowed sociology, political science, uh, actually social psychology as well at that time, the um, SPS sort of basis of the, of the tripos, um, to come together and, and, and to really sort of grow. And it came out of, of the Department of Economics, so it, it, it came away from the applied economics. And it needed to in order you know, to, to develop the, the identity of those subjects. But the problem in terms of, you know, breaking away from that larger departmental background and now separating off into three smaller departments, um, well, politics is obviously pretty big, having merged with international studies, um, but for and social psychology, of course, is even bigger, having um, merged with experimental psychology. But for sociology, we're a very small department in comparative terms, in terms of the size of sociology at other British universities. And that really is a challenge. And one of the reasons it's a challenge is because... Um, the lead table, if you like, for research is, is the research excellence framework. And that matters enormously because it, it divvies up the research budgets between the universities. Assessment of research is likely to favour bigger departments because large research centres are bringing in you know, the money bringing in a lot of the sort of infrastructural support, the postdocs, et cetera, which, which are um, very important in terms of the overall research environment. How do we get around that challenge? Um, I think 
what we've been trying to do, and this goes right back, is well, we might be small, but to you know, try and act big, if you like. And, and part of the way of doing that is to make sure that we're, we're picking up on all of the pockets of sociological research right across the university and and you know sort of trying to to wield something that's 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 bigger than just you know the the actual boundaries of the sociology department and that you know that is a challenge i mean um, education and criminology are, are sort of separate but obviously both have applied sociologists in their field. There's sociology in public health, there's political sociology, some of which is, is really sort of under the polis banner. Um, but there's also the interdisciplinary centres like the Centre for Family Research, like the Institute of Public Health, like you know the Human Rights Centre. Um, and it's really, really important that sort of sociology is part of that bigger group too. Well, in, in, in terms of, of rapid change, um, this should be one of the real sort of opportunities of, of, of sociology. I mean, if, if sociology um, has the tools for, for really trying to understand social change, then the current world is, <laughs> is a fascinating, if sometimes rather depressing, um, um, place to place to live. I think one of the challenges for sociology going forwards is um, really exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's the challenge of how to make our research not just relevant for society writ large, not just our small academic bubbles, if you like, our little ivory towers, um, but to also really um, do the work to make those connections. I mean, sociologists need to at least push some of their research findings um, beyond the publication. So they're talking to politicians, so they're engaging with practitioners. We're, we're really engaging with the people who have the responsibility um, for trying to steer social change. And I think we could do more of that. Um, I mean, we have managed to get to the top of league tables in teaching, and I'm pretty optimistic about teaching for the future. I mean, we've never sort of sat back and rested on, on laurels where um, we're, we're pretty critical of the content of the curriculum, the curriculum changes. Um, we've, we've looked very carefully at, at trying to take out, you know, the, the, the sort of huge gender biases in the curriculum and now decolonization, etc. These are, these are changes which really need to happen. Um, and I think that as sociologists, we're very aware of that. So in, in teaching terms, um, you know, it's it, 50 years from now, I have no idea what the sociology curriculum would be. And that must be a good thing because I also have no idea what 50 years of change is going to bring um, to the subject of sociology. Mm -hmm.